a history of role playing games in 101 objects. Uh, and in this chapter, actually, not uh, a full chapter, we're going to go off as a little bit of a tangent, and I call this little bit all publicity. Dot, dot. Um, we're in the late 70s, we're in 1979. Dungeons and Dragons is doing very well for TSR, uh, it's a growing company. Uh, sales are on the up, sort of doubling every year, which is great. Um, but it's still, for the most part, something that's sold to people who who have come across it because they know somebody else who's played. It doesn't really have a, a widespread um, widespread presence in the in the collective domestic psyche in the United States and certainly nowhere else. It's played by gamers, and that's a small demographic. Something happens in 1979 that really propels Dungeons and Dragons into the public consciousness. And it's not a good story, but we're going to look into it. <coughs> now, in, in the last chapter, I did say we'd be looking at the satanic panic in this section, but actually I've, dis I've decided to split this in into two halves uh, because the satanic panic was really a uh, mid 80s thing. Uh, and I want to look specifically at what happens in the late 70s. The particular event is the disappearance of a young man called James Dallas Egbert III. He was something of a child prodigy. Uh, he'd started university, uh, Michigan State University, uh, doing a computer science degree, despite only being 16 years old. And he was a player of Dungeons and Dragons. And he disappeared. And this was a major news story at the time. And one thing that the press cottoned on to was the fact that he played Dungeons and Dragons. And there were suggestions that um, the particular group that he played with, um, they often had sessions in the in the steam tunnels underneath the university. I must admit, I had to look up what steam tunnels are. It seems to be some sort of ventilation thing. But if you imagine sort of large, they're, they're not caves but by any means, but imagine sort of large service tunnels underneath the university. Uh, and apparently a cool place to play Dungeons and Dragons. I suppose if you're a student, often you have, you know, fairly small rooms, and I think a lot of university, a lot of American universities, they have to share rooms as well, so maybe even less common space. Anyway, so James and his friends would play in the steam tunnels under Michigan State University. James went missing, uh, and was missing for quite some time. His parents hired a private detective, and the private detective sort of examined um, James's life and honed in on the Dungeons and Dragons aspect. Not to the exclusion of all else. I don't want to give you the idea that the private investigator didn't do a good job. Because actually the private investigator found James Dallas Egbert III alive and not well, but alive. Um, it's fair to say, looking, in, looking into the case, James had some quite serious personal issues. And the Dungeons and Dragons thing was... I would guess for him was a was a release, a way to make friends, um, which I imagine is probably quite difficult if you're 16 years old and you're at university with people who are substantially older. But he had a number of issues, which I, I, I won't go into. There are uh, a number of books about it, but link to a couple down, down below, uh, and, and online articles that will give you a bit more of the detailed story. I don't really want to dwell on on James himself, because it is ultimately a sad story. The private investigator found him. Um, he had essentially run away uh, after two failed suicide attempts, one of which actually, I think, was in the steam tunnels. Uh, and he'd, he'd run away, uh, taken on casual work to support himself, at obviously a very young age. Uh, the private investigator found him, took him home to his uncle, I think. Um, but there isn't a happy ending for James. He actually did commit suicide some time later. The Pride Investigator came to the conclusion, uh, and later wrote a book about this, that Dungeons & Dragons had not really contributed to James's uh, issues or to his suicide. But that's not what many people hung their hats on. You know, they, they found they'd not heard of Dungeons & Dragons. The idea of a, of a game where you take on a completely different persona in a different world seemed weird to them. Um, and it's it's the beginning of the controversy around uh, around Dungeons and Dragons that you get in the United States. Not quite this sort of satanic panic yet. Now you might think that the effect of this on Dungeons and Dragons would be negative, and you could be further from the truth. 
Uh, and to show you this, I'm going to show you shortly a, a sales chart, a TSR sales chart, reproduced from the Wall Street Journal. In fact, here it is. And you can see, look at that, 1979, 77, 78, 79, you know, sales had doubled between 78 and 79. 79 to 80, and then 80 to 81. Look at the sales rise after 1979. Is that all down to the James Dallas Egbert III case? So are we saying then that the that the Egbert case helped Dungeons and Dragons rather than hindered it? Well, yes, we are. And I think what, what the big part of that is that Dungeons and Dragons didn't have a place in the public consciousness before then. Nobody, not nobody, but very few people knew about it outside of the gaming community. And suddenly it's front page news, it's in national newspapers, it's on national television news. And so people have heard about it. And obviously as part of these news reports, there are explanations of what the game is. And okay, some people will no doubt be horrified by what the game sounds like. But an awful lot of other people thought, well, that sounds quite cool. I quite fancy that. I'll look into this. And no doubt that's a big part of this sales increase. Is it most of that sales increase? I, I suspect probably not. I think it would be naive to think that that massive sales increase is just due to the Egbert affair. Um, I think my argument is this. I think that the Egbert case came about at precisely the right time for TSR in terms of the kind of product that they had available. Had it happened, had this publicity happened several years earlier when Dungeons and Dragons was something that came in a crappy cardboard box and was relatively expensive for something that came in a crappy cardboard box, I don't think it would have had the impact. But 1979, you, you're starting to get the three AD&D hardbacks getting out onto shelves of mainstream high street bookshops. So you've got a presence there, you've got product in front of people's eyes who are going to a bookshop. You're starting to get the basic sets, I think probably by this point it will be the Magenta Moldve basic BX. Uh, you're starting to see those on the shelves of toy shops. So again, you're seeing D&D product if you aren't necessarily a wargamer. Uh, going into a special shop, you're seeing it on the shelves of a toy shop. You're a kid, you see things, you see that, and you think, well, that looks cool. Um, and you're going and you're seeing the AD&D books on the shelves of bookshops. So you've got that availability of product and that kind of product at the time when D&D &D gets a major publicity boost because of the Egbert case. And I think ultimately that's the reason that the sales shoot up. It's, it's that perfect storm that happens all together. We're going to look, I've mentioned the satanic panic a couple of times now, and we are going to look at that um, in a later tangent. Because it is very important to the history of role-playing games in the 1980s. But we're still really in the 1970s, and I don't want to... This is why I wanted to split those two, um, to, to keep the James Dallas Egbert case separate from the later satanic panic, which is, has many things in common, and there's another suicide in there, but... Uh, I think ultimately they are two separate events in the way that they influence all playing games. So, until next time, thank you very much.